SJC 10476, Commonwealth v. Yat Fung Eng. Okay, Attorney McLean. Good morning, may it please the court. Ian McLean on behalf of the Commonwealth. Along me with Assistant District Attorney Lynn Feigenbaum, seated behind me. She assisted in the evidentiary hearing on remand from this court. And before we begin with the substantive argument, I'd like to acknowledge several members of the deceased victim, Kareem Brown's family, with us here in the courtroom today, including his wife, Stacy Lewis Brown, as well as several members of Kareem Brown's family that are watching on the live stream today. Your Honors, this court should reverse the allowance of the motion for new trial. Attorney Scapiccio made a rational decision when she elected to preview the anticipated testimony of Omar Sierra in her opening statement, and therefore it was not manifestly unreasonable. And second, the failure to pivot to a reasonable provocation defense here was not ineffective because that was not a viable defense under the facts of this case. Beginning with the opening statement questions, Your Honor. <clears throat> Whether to open it all and what to include in an opening is a strategic decision or tactical decision. And here, when we're talking about previewing testimony, the test comes in two prongs. First, was the attorney prepared or was there some incompetency in their preparation? And then second, was the inability to produce the testimony a decision or outside of that attorney's control? Here, both of those prongs favor the Commonwealth. How about a motion in limine before you uh uh, lay out the, uh, the, the toothpaste that can't go back in the tube. Yes, Your Honor. Here, filing a motion in limine would have placed the defendant in exactly the same position. She would have filed a motion in limine regarding the verbal completeness, whether the testimony was admissible as verbal completeness, should Omar Sierra testify. Presumably, the motion judge would have said, yes, the testimony is admissible. Well, so she would a spontaneous uh, utterance argument. As a, as a fallback argument, Your Honor, yes, as a fallback argument. So she you had say a, it's a fallback argument. You don't think it's a strong argument? No, Your Honor. I mean, it's, it's, it's a possible argument. The, the trial judge could have gone either way with that ruling. I mean, we're talking about a statement that was made by the defendant 20 minutes after having murdered someone in front of a dozen victims while he was still fleeing from the murder. And the, um, the witness himself, Omar Sierra, indicated that the defendant, the declarant, was anxious and nervous on the phone call. And you can see that at Commonwealth Appendix 237. That's the BPD report about the initial interview with Omar Sierra. So she had a legitimate basis to believe that even if the Commonwealth didn't call the witness, she was going to call the witness and would be able to get it in as an excited utterance. So it was a rational decision here. And the question is not, Your Honor, whether, it's, whether there's a different course of action that could have possibly achieved a better result. That's hindsight. That's not the appropriate test. The appropriate test here is to look at the decision that was made and evaluate that decision for whether it was rational. And that's what this court said just last year in Martin, reiterating the appropriate test is not hindsight and looking at other decisions that could have been made. It's evaluating the decision that was made. I have a little trouble on, so she had a legitimate belief that she could get this in as a spontaneous utterance, right? You're, you're saying that now. At this point, you're sort of taking the defendant's position, right? So then when it, she's not allowed to do it, it it's somewhat of a surprise, right? So does that suggest she wasn't ineffective for going ahead with this? Or I'm, I'm confused a little bit because you're taking the defendant's position a little bit on the admissibility of the evidence. Well, what, what I'm saying, Your Honor, is that... Because then my follow-up point is, but the judge denies it. So is the judge, is there an error here on that point? No, Your Honor, and regardless, that question is not before the court right now. So I get uh, it, but it, we sort of have to work through it, don't we? I will defer to my colleagues who are the evidence professors, but if that's an error, isn't this whole thing get bollocked up? No, Your Honor, no, because the question is whether she made a rational decision at the time not whether there were alternative things she could have done that might have possibly protected the defendant better. Was her decision rational? And that's what this court said in Martin, citing back to Kolonovic. The manifestly unreasonable test is a search for rationality. But, but, you're, but you're saying her decision is rational because it might very well be a spontaneous utterance. But then the judge denies it, which creates a whole other set of issues for us, right? That this critical piece of evidence for her doesn't get in. Again, I, I don't want to distract you. Go ahead. So the, here the first prong of the test in the opening statement is, was she prepared? Here she was fully prepared. We're talking about a seasoned, experienced criminal defense attorney with over 50 first-degree murder trials at this point in her career. She had the case for 14 months. 
She reviewed all of the discovery, transcript at 35. She indicated that. She sought and obtained two continuances, so she knew she could obtain continuances. She didn't seek one here. She was aware of the statement from Omar Sierra. She was aware that it occurred 20 minutes after the murder. She was aware of the content. She spoke with her client about it, and she sent an investigator to interview Omar Sierra. She was fully prepared when she set foot in there to give the opening statement. Can, can I ask you about the, that whole promises made in, um, based upon um, a misapprehension of evidence. Um, Justice Lowy uh, points out the answer was a motion in limine, right? Do we have any cases that say that? No, Your Honor. The, 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 the seminal case in this area is Garvin, which just talks about were they adequately prepared, or was their preparation incompetent, and then was their ability to produce it outside of their control. So again, I point to the principal theory of admissibility here was verbal completeness. And she had every reason to believe that the Commonwealth was going to call this witness. Can you explain that? Because the Commonwealth did not talk about the witness during their opening. It's clear that she requested that, that the um, witness come to Massachusetts. Why, why did you think, why, why, why do you make the statement that, that she believed the Commonwealth was going to call a witness? Several reasons, Your Honor. First, it was the Commonwealth that filed the motion to have the witness transported here from New Jersey. At her request, wasn't it? She, thought, discussed, she discussed it with the Commonwealth about the proper mechanism to get him here to ensure he would be here. So the Commonwealth took those steps, filed the motion. The trial judge ruled on the motion, allowing it. The witness was transferred here to Massachusetts. She was aware of that in advance of giving her opening statement. The assistant district attorney told her prior to impanelment that he intended to call Mr. Sierra. That's at transcript 23. So when we're evaluating her decision, it's what did she know at that time? At that time, she believed the Commonwealth was going to call Mr. Sierra as a witness, a reasonable belief based on all the steps the Commonwealth jumped through to get him there and indicating to her they intended to call the witness. Now, Mr. Sierra, after opening statements, changed the substance of what his testimony would be during an interview with the assistant district attorney. So the assistant district attorney, the prosecutor, changed his strategy and decided not to call Sierra as a witness. That is outside of the defense attorney's control here. That's why it was not manifested. Was that communicated to the defense attorney? Yes, Your Honor. The morning after the decision was made, which is, again, two days after impanelment, that was communicated. At that point, the defense attorney moved to her fallback argument and began a series of concerted efforts to get the statement in through another mechanism, excited utterance, spontaneous utterance or she also argued a state of mind and the general hearsay exception. Can, can I ask you about the provocation uh, instruction? And as Justice Kafka points out when he asked you about the evidentiary ruling where you basically are switching sides, you switch sides decidedly on provocation because at trial, the uh, uh, trial prosecutor asks, says that the, it warrants provocation, right? Does that foreclose you from arguing that now? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. This is not a waived argument, as, as the defense now suggests. What the trial ADA did was submit basically generic instruction saying, Your Honor, if you're going to give this instruction, we want you to give the model instruction. That's basically what happened here. And yes, the trial ADA is the person who brought it to the court's attention after the And I, I didn't read the charge conference. Did they talk about what the evidence raised in, in the, did the trial prosecutor say it raises self-defense and it raises provocation? No, Your Honor, never in the charge conference. The charge conference began with the trial judge, Sue Esponti, saying, I'm giving the self-defense instruction on the basis of Juan Tucker's testimony. And then they moved on, with no discussion at all ever about any of the other means of reducing a conviction from is murder it, to Is manslaughter. it the Commonwealth's position that the self-defense instruction was warranted on the evidence? <coughs> it, it could have been, Your Honor. But again, that's not a question that's before, before the court here. I well, would say it, it could be, because it also goes to whether or not there's provocation. Well, it was, it was very weak on the fact of, of any retreat uh, or the reasonableness of the belief that he was facing imminent harm. But the self-defense instruction was given on the basis of Juan Tucker's testimony. It matters as it relates to the statement as well. Right. I'm sorry, Your Honor? It, it matters as it relates to the statement as well, whether there was a right to a self-defense instruction. Well, the, sta the statement itself, Your Honor, was essentially the, com the relevant component of it was, he came at me, so I had to shoot him. So regarding self-defense, that's only going to achieve the subjective component. It doesn't touch at all on the objective oh, component. I understand. I'm going to Justice Gaziano's point. We don't also, it takes away the issue of the um, admissibility of the statement and the prejudice that flows from it if there's no right to a self-defense. Well, respectfully from our position, Your Honor, this is a set of facts where there just is no good defense. The defense attorney did the best they could with what they had. This is a set of facts where but, the, no, the The question that I've asked you and Justice Lowy has asked you, not whether it was a good defense, but whether there was legally sufficient 
evidence to raise either a self-defense or a provocation defense? From, from the Commonwealth's perspective, no, Your Honor. But the self-defense instruction was given, so we didn't consider that before the court here today. Um, the, the reasonable provocation instruction was not warranted here under this set of facts because there simply wasn't enough to establish a sudden loss of the ability to control yourself. I point you to... That, that, that's, that's the point I, I guess I, I'm obliquely trying to make. Now let me try to be explicit. In a case that does raise self-defense, does it necessarily raise provocation? Other than, other than the situation of, of, of defense of another, which is a different issue. No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. The two are separate, and there are factual situations where a self-defense claim, a self-defense instruction could be warranted and a reasonable provocation not warranted. Give me one. <clears throat> um, well, I, I would start by giving you the in-opposite, Your Honor, where you walk into, you come home at night, and you walk into your bedroom, and you see your spouse in bed with someone else. Under that set of facts, you could, a person could well have lost the ability for cool reflection or restraint and simply acted. So a reasonable provocation is absolutely warranted in that set of facts, and that doesn't come anywhere near self-defense, Your Honor. To give, how about the fight example that we have here? Well, Your Honor, I'd point you to, to several different cases from this court, Brea, Bianchi, Felix, and then even Vinton, um, where here the defendant engaged in a verbal argument back and forth with, uh, that he chose to enter, insert himself into, a verbal argument with the victim. Mere words, that's not enough. That doesn't get you reasonable provocation. He then left the situs of that argument, went back to his car. The record's not perfectly clear, but about three car lengths away. Obtained a gun, and then took a few steps back towards the situs of the argument. Are, aren't, you that's taking the, aren't you taking the facts in the light most favorable to, to you? I, I mean, throughout a lot of your brief. I mean, there's, there's a lot of interaction between the victim and, and the defendant here. It's more than just words, isn't there? There at least if you're taking the testimony in the light most favorable to the defendant, which we have to do at this point, right? Yes, Your Honor, you do have to look at the evidence in the light most favorable to the defendant, but there is a line where that becomes unreasonable. Just, but here, even if you I, want to I know take, you don't think there's much here, but isn't there a much better provocation def defense than a self-defense? No, Your Honor, and I, I point you to Bianchi and Felix, where in Bianchi, an unarmed victim punched the defendant in the face in an argument, and that didn't warrant a reasonable provocation instruction. Mr. Sultan's going to get up here and give you a very different set of facts. Um, and uh, under the most advantageous facts that he has, Rosenfeld was the witness who said, the victim got no closer than five feet before he stopped and started backing up. There's no suggestion whatsoever that the victim was armed. No, no witness. Un unlike Meshach Little or Fortini, correct? Correct, Your Honor. There is no suggestion that the witness ever, the victim ever had anything in his hands. In the light most favorable to the defendant, his hands were closed as fists. He had torn his jacket off, thrown it to the ground, sort of banged his chest, and approached, walked towards the victim. And, and what is the size the differential? I can't remember. The, the size of the two, the victim and the defendant? So, I, I know it's hard to hear through these masks. The size? The, uh, the victim was uh, a larger man than the defendant. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yes. Um, Not but only is he a larger man, he's just overpowered two other people and, and, and um, uh, gritting his teeth and um, putting his fist into his hand and, and uh, you know, he's talking about the defendant is. And the victim said, basically just keeps on moving toward the gun. Go ahead and shoot me. And he keeps on going. And the light most favorable to the defendant Go ahead and shoot me. He's just overpowered two people. Is, is it close, or it's clearly not enough? It's not enough, Your Honor. And I would point you to the witness whose testimony you're talking about is Rosenfeld. And I would suggest that you read all of his testimony. It's at volume five, and it's a short snippet of testimony, 154 to about 158. And what Rosenfeld says is he got no closer than five feet before he stopped, began backing away. And when he was shot, he was 10 to 15 feet away from the defendant. I get it how that's the self-defense, it weakens the self-defense argument dramatically. But it, it's just as Justice Lowy said, he's just basically beaten up two people, right? The victim has thrown this woman to the ground, right? There's another person. He's knocked down. Um, he's much bigger. That doesn't get you to provocation? It, no, Your Honor. And here's why. The first two cases I'm going to ask look at Mr. Sultan, are there cases like that? You want to anticipate that? Vinton is the first, Your Honor. He left, the person left the scene, went back to his car, got a knife, returned to the scene. That leaving the scene returning vitiates reasonable provocation. Here, Bre and then I'd point you also to Brea. No reasonable provocation after a, an argument in a bar escalates to a fight outside of a bar where he watches 
the, the, the victim punch one of his friends. So tell, me, tell us again uh, where in the facts, as you've been describing them, where does that break come in this case when the defendant enters his car and, and retrieves the gun? Yes, Your Honor. So he observes the, the scuffle or fight, as Justice Kafka is referring to, where the victim pushes two people to the ground. The defendant then chooses to insert himself into this scrum as it's breaking up. At that point, he gets into the argument with the victim. At the conclusion of that argument, where during it, what he said was, what's up, tough guys? You think you're bulletproof? I got something for you in my trunk. Then he leaves that scene, travels three car lengths away, goes into his trunk, and gets a gun. When you say he leaves the scene, is the victim following him at that point? So the scene is not left, but following him? The, so the victim, one of the victim's friends gets him into a car, and then the, the victim gets out, out of the car and yeah. pursues the, the, the defendant towards so when his you own say vehicle. leave the scene, like you just did, you mean the defendant walks to his car and the victim is walking behind him? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. And is that similar? Am I, when I look at Vincent and Brea, I'm going to see the same type of following by the victim? Not exactly. No, okay. not exactly, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, but I, I would then point you to what happens next. As the victim continues to approach the defendant once he has the gun, the victim gets no closer than five feet from the one witness who says How as close tall as are possible. You? I don't recall the exact height, Your Honor, but there was How a height tall are you? I am 6'2", Your Honor. Okay, so <clears throat> less than your height, the victim is from the defendant. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. In the light most, in the light most favorable. Which is what we have to do to, to decide whether or not a reasonable provocation instruction is Yes, warranted. Your Honor, but if you cherry pick that one phrase from that witness's testimony, that's not necessarily the light most favorable because the next thing that witness says is the victim stopped and began retreating. And at the moment that the defendant raised the gun and shot the victim, 10 to 15 feet away. So he had backed away at least five feet. So that's a good point, but, but we're talking about an issue where you've, you, you're not able to engage in reflection. And if you have had something happen that constitutes reasonable provocation, and that's already occurred, the fact that two seconds after that, someone now backs up, even though they were coming at you, even though you had a gun out, doesn't necessarily immediately dissipate reasonable provocation if it existed. Well, respectfully, Your Honor, I completely disagree with that. Think the about it. Reasonable, about provo it. reasonable provocation is a question of it overcoming your ability to engage in reflection or thought. Here the victim got five feet away, stopped, began retreating, and then the defendant raised his gun and shot him once he okay. was 10 to 15 feet away. Okay, but the, you just said it. What if he had already reached that point at 10 feet and 5 feet? He already reached that point. Well, Your Honor, I would, I'd point you to Bianchi and Felix. No reasonable provocation where a victim lunged at and punched the defendant in Felix. In Bianchi, unarmed victim punched the defendant in the face, and that wasn't enough for a reasonable provocation instruction. What's the difference here? Because he's an African-American man? That's not a basis well, on I which to give a reasonable I, provocation I, I, I understand it's a, it, it's a close call, and I think you'd agree, based on Judge Kerpolani's finding, that if there's a right to a reasonable provocation instruction, that that would constitute reason for a new trial. I, I do not agree with Judge Kerpolani's finding at all that this that this set of facts warrants a reasonable provocation instruction. No, a I, reasonable I, I, okay. person. No, I, I, that's not my question. I, I, I hear you loud and clear. My question. I, I agree it's a close call, and like Justice Gaziano said, we don't have anything like Little, for instance, uh, or anything close to that with making a move for a hip or reach, knowing we had a firearm before. Nothing like that exists here. I realize it's a close call. However, my question is. Considering Judge Kerpolani credited Attorney Scarpiccio that um, it, it wasn't strategic to not request a reasonable provocation, if, if he wa was entitled to the instruction, then there'd need to be a new trial. Yes, Your Honor. It's purely a question of law here because, okay. because it was, the testimony was credited that it was an error and not a strategic decision. <clears throat> But this set of facts doesn't warrant it. To give that reasonable provocation instruction under this set of facts means any time somebody is five feet away from you and yelling, it, that constitutes reasonable provocation. Or an objectively reasonable person can no longer control themselves when someone is five feet away from them and then backing away. This set of facts did not warrant reasonable provocation. Your, your position is that the, to give reasonable provocation in this case would turn our case law about words and gestures not being enough on its head, correct? Yes, Your Honor, absolutely. But can I ask a follow-up to that? If we also have the 
beating up of the two other people. Does that allow a distinction there? Because you've got, it's not just verbal, but we actually have physical contact with two other people in the same melee. Does that distinguish this case or not? Here, not at all, Your Honor, because of the break in time in the events. He sees the two people pushed to the ground, and then he chooses to voluntarily insert himself into the but, situation. So it's just, it's, it's the break in time that's critical. Otherwise, Pro provocation it, has to be personal as opposed to defense of another, correct? Yes, Your Honor. The, the, the situation you're describing is now we're in the realm of talking about defense of another. I, okay, but, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. and, I have a, just a fact question. We keep referring to the victim pushing two people down. Was it three? It was, there was the woman, Miller. There was um, the truck driver, right? And then wasn't there his friend as well? Well, in the, in the initial scrum before the defendant chose yeah, to insert himself. All told before the shooting. Two. My understanding is when he pushed his, his own friend, he pushed him out of the way, not to the ground. So I... That's my understanding of the facts, Your Honor. Okay, so, but there were three pushes all told before the shooting. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, yes. thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Attorney Sultan. <clears throat> Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, since I rarely get to sit on this side of the uh, podium, <laughs> I, I'd like to start, if I may, by briefly addressing the standard of review. In order to uh, reverse or justify the reversal of Judge Kerpelani's uh, decision in this case, granting uh, a new trial, the Commonwealth has to show that that decision was an abuse of discretion, uh, meaning that it was outside the range of reasonable alternatives. Uh, and as this court said uh, last year in Diaz-Perez, it will only reverse uh, if the uh, granting of the new trial motion was manifestly unjust. Uh, furthermore, uh, the uh, credibility determinations that the motion may, judge made based on the evidentiary hearing uh, are, of course, final and unreviewable. And a second issue with respect to standard review is that since this is a first-degree murder case, still under 33E review, this court reviews claims of ineffective assistance not under the uh, traditional Seferian standard, but rather under the right standard. Uh, that is, whether uh, trial counsel committed uh, an error or errors, and if so, uh, did those errors likely influence the jury's conclusion? You'd, you'd agree, Mr. Sultan, that it really comes down to uh, taking the, the, the opening statement issue separately. The provocation issue comes down to whether or not it was justified in a light most favorable to your client by the evidence. If it was, then um, if, if the instruction should have been given, new trial. If it shouldn't have been given, there was no harm. Well, I don't think it's that simple, Your Honor, uh, uh, respectfully. Number one, I, I think there is a waiver or a forfeiture here. And, and this is very similar to cases I cited in my brief where the Commonwealth uh, doesn't just not object to trial, but affirmatively takes a position at trial and then tries to take the opposite position on appeal. I mean, the court doesn't, uh, frankly, uh, uh, let defendants get away with that uh, frequently, and they shouldn't let the Commonwealth get away with it. The Commonwealth didn't just say, as my brother suggested, well, if you're going to give a heat of passion uh, provocation instruction, please follow uh, the model instruction. That's not what they said. I quote their request for instructions. They said, based on the evidence of this, <clears throat> in this case, it is necessary for the jury to consider the mitigating circumstance of uh, heat of passion upon reasonable provocation. They said it was necessary. They submitted that request to the judge. Uh, and now they're saying, oh, it, it never should have been such a, it wasn't justified. They can't engage in that kind of gamesmanship. This is a first-degree murder case. They forfeited that, that claim. So I think that's a serious argument, Your Honor, that the court should, should consider before it even addresses whether the evidence was sufficient. A second point, Your Honor, is the trial judge was clearly prepared to give this instruction. There was, both sides had asked for it. At sidebar, after the instru initial instructions, the prosecutor brought it up again. The judge confirmed that the, from defense counsel, you don't want that instruction anymore, in effect? I mean, he was going to give that instruction. 
So her express waiver of that instruction changed the instruction. I mean, the instruction would have been given. It would have been the law of the case. And I think that is something the court should consider. And then finally, if the court does reach the question about whether he was entitled to that instruction, uh, Judge Kerpelani <coughs> got it exactly right. I mean, the Commonwealth, even today, okay, they don't can, want to talk about Can you about get to the $64,000 question, though, which is, is there sufficient evidence here to justify a provocation instruction? And, and you know, your brother has distinguished the cases, so I, I just help me out uh, and why you, you get it. Well, that's exactly the, what, what I'm about to address, Your Honor. When, when I want to, and even today, the, the Commonwealth doesn't, they don't, they want to ignore the testimony. They, they say they're looking at the evidence in the light most favorable to the defendant. They are ignoring the witness who was the most favorable to the defendant, Juan Tucker, the final witness, uh, civilian, civilian witness on this subject of what I witnessed. He said that, not only did he say that uh, the decedent was pursuing uh, the defendant quickly. Not only did he say that the decedent said to the, to, to the defendant twice, you better run, but finally Tucker said that the decedent continued to move towards Mr. Ng, the defendant, even after Ng displayed a gun. The, the victim's unarmed. What, give me your best case, because this is not little, this is not Fortini. What's your best case, Mr. Sultan? Your, your Honor, I've, I've read all, a lot of these cases. I don't think there's a case. I mean, every one of them has different factual scenarios. I don't have a but case. We have, but the but the, our, our case law is words and gestures, even punches and threats, aren't enough. So That's convince right. the me court otherwise. At, the court has to look at, obviously, all the circumstances. Here, the, defend, the, the, the decedent... Not only had he thrown Jane Miller to the ground, not only did he throw Greg Wheeler to the ground like a rag doll, not only in the words of his own friend, Lee, was he throwing bodies, not only did he punch somebody else, not only did he jump out of the car, rip off his jacket, throw it to the ground, rip open his shirt, and com say, you com better com run. Commonwealth versus what, Mr. Sultan? There's no case like that. I I'm not going to say that there's a case just like this. What's uh, the closest case? I, I think that, that those are, you, I mean, every factual scenario is different. The issue is looking at, at all of the evidence I know, but, but you're, most but you're, favorable. I, I, I get the legal so standard. I'm, I'm not prepared and you understand to say the legal, this case If you could stop talking while I talk. I get the legal standard. What you're facing is our case law that says words and gestures are not enough. And usually when we do carve exceptions to that, it's someone's armed, someone's given informative, I'm going to reach for a gun. Um, usually there's something else. I'm, to, I'm to asking you for the something else, Mr. Sultan. Well, Your Honor, I think, I think the cases clearly say that it can, it's combination of things, you know, is, 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 was it Rhodes where, you know, the, 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 the decedent, uh, you know, bit the uh, uh, defendant's penis. There are, there are all kinds of factual scenarios. Here it is a combination of things. It is not just words and gestures. But the combination, and I, I cut you off, you're going to tell me, but the combination is the, the violence by the victim that preceded and him coming towards the, the, the victim, even though he, the victim is armed? The combination of him assaulting several people, him acting in a violent, out of control, combative, aggressive fashion, his coming toward the decedent rapidly, saying, you better run, his, him being a larger person, all of those is things. That, when, when he says that, Mr. Sultan, is the... Is the um, is the defendant um, brandishing the handgun when he threatens him? I'm sorry, Your Honor, I missed that. Yeah, I, I, it's a, uh, when he makes that statement, you better run, is the defendant armed at that time? No, Your Honor, and the, but the, uh, the defendant is not armed. And, the, and, and he, basically, this guy, who's, who people said his eyes were, Wheeler said his eyes were crazy, he appeared to be on something other than alcohol, he, this, this large aggressive, violent person is coming toward Mr. Ng saying, you better run, and, and pursuing him as Ng retreats toward his car. So, you know, the, so the question is looking at that in the light most favorable to the defendant. That, that's what I'm doing, counsel. Let me ask you this question over here. 
what's bothering me about the totality of these circumstances that you're pointing out to is yeah, there was no testimony that he piled on whomever he knocked down and continued to beat, upon, beat on them, do something other than knock them down. So even if I give you all of that, does that mean you get to go to your car, pull out a gun, and shoot them? It, it, it doesn't give you self-defense, Your Honor. I, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm at the reasonable provocation. Well, re okay? Well, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at provocation. Okay. Well, what this court has said, going back a lot of years, is you know what reasonable provocation is about, and heat of passion is is to account for the frailties of human beings in circumstances that happen. You know, there's a, a, a emotionally and things, and, and there are sudden things that happen, and people respond in a way that it, that it produces in them a feeling of passion, anger fear, fright, or nervous excitement that eclipses their capacity for reflection and restraint. That's a pretty bushy standard. It is, but it's a mushy standard that's about human frailty. This is a situation that happened fast. Mr. Ng went in as a good Samaritan after seeing a woman knocked to the ground and things escalated. He was being threatened, he was being pursued, and he reacted in an inappropriate way by getting a gun and using it. There's no question, I'm not defending what he did, mm -hmm. but that is what heat of passion manslaughter is about. And he surely, and it's a jury question. I'm not, I'm not the but jury, do you have, and, and mean, your honors aren't the jury, but he was entitled to that instruction. He asked, and, and the Commonwealth agreed he was entitled to that instruction, and the jury should have been given that opportunity. He was deprived of that substantial defense. He didn't get the chance for the jury to decide whether they agreed or not. That's all, he need, that's all he's entitled to is a fair trial. He's not entitled to a, a, a judgment of acquittal on murder. He's entitled to a fair trial. Can I ask Mr. Solomon? That defense was, should have been before the jury, is and he didn't there, get that. Is there a, I mean, these melees are so common in the law. Don't you have a case besides Rose for us that we could look at that, that we can say this is the closest case to, to your situation? I mean, because it just seems strange that, you know, we have so many of these murders arising out of melees. You should be able to find one that creates this provocation instruction for us. It, really, you can't find one? Mr. Sultan, may I answer that question for Justice Kafker? Go ahead. Because they'd be <laughs> not guilty. That's, excuse me. Sorry, Your Honor. They'd be not guilty. Well, well so we wouldn't see it. You, I mean, if, if, if Your Honor will give me leave to do it, I will go through all of the, you know, there's 50 of them, cases on this subject and try to find the one that's closest to this. But frankly, I don't think that's the, there is no bright line. If Your Honor is saying, can't we just find a bright line so we don't have to fight about this in all these cases? Well, well, no, think, there is no bright but line. But Justice Gaziano's identified, you know, he's been able to separate each one of these. Um, particularly the fact that beating up somebody else um, in combination with this is not enough. So I'm just trying to find a case that's really helpful to beating you. Beating up somebody else is not, is not so good. I get it, but I'm, are there cases that say when you're beating up someone right next to you and screaming at you, that's enough for provocation? I mean, is there anything like that we can look at? I, look, I apologize. I did not come here today ready to kind of try to put this case in a particular <coughs> Slot. I'm happy to, if the, I will, if the court will let me do it, I will be happy within 24 hours to give the court something to try to find the case that's most like this one. But I don't think that's the test. I think it's a, it's, it's a much more, much more of kind of a gestalt test. Uh, are these the kinds of circumstances? Yeah, I, 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 I'm fairly familiar with the case, so I don't think you're going to find, like you said, that there's a legal standard and there are factual scenarios, and this is unique. Um, let me ask you, though, I'm curious, Mr. Sullivan, is it your view? that uh, the self-defense instruction should not have been given? No, Your Honor, I think, I think that given, given Tucker's testimony that the decedent was still coming at Ng after he saw a gun, uh, you know, I think looking at the evidence of light favorable to the most favorable to the defendant, you know, it was, uh, I think a judge and, and I'm, I'm, I could have gone either way, but I'm not saying it shouldn't and be I'm given. And I'm trying to do the Venn diagram about self-defense and provocation. Yeah. Are you gonna have? Do they intersect in broad swipes? So if you if if you had a right of self defense, and you had this fear that led you to use deadly force. Does that, in this case, in there, um, necessitate a provocation because the frailties are the same? Well, Your Honor, I, I, 
I don't. I think they're different, and I. I, I, I know they're I know different, that, I, but, I, like, I, but like, here, do they intersect? I recall reading, I think, a decision by uh, Justice Seifer when she was on the appeals court. Maybe it's Aya Cavello or something, where uh, basically she found or she, she wrote for the court there was enough evidence for self-defense, but there wasn't for provocation because self-defense sort of requires a defendant to make a calculation. Uh, you know, basically, do I have to act? Do I have to use deadly force to defend myself? Or do I have an opportunity to retreat? And, well, that's part of it, too, of course, Your Honor. But it's much more of a calculation. Heat of passion, there's no calculation. There's just, uh, you know, uh, my, 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 my ability to be rational and use reflection. How do you spell that, counsel? <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question about that error point because the Commonwealth <laughs> is saying that when the pursuit turns into retreat, that that means that you couldn't have reasonable provocation. And I think your point is, well, if you've already hit that point, the two seconds of retreat doesn't dissipate it. Well, that's totally correct, Your Honor. Unless you've had time to cool off, you, the provocation already exists. Moreover, there, the, it is not clear that he retreated. Tucker said he was still coming forward. Uh, Medina said, I'm not sure if he was coming forward or not. Although Medina had testified before the grand jury, he was still coming but we, forward. We, I mean, it, 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 Mr. McQuain says that Tucker also says he goes backwards, right? He retreats. No, Tucker said he continued to go forward uh, uh, in, until he was shot. Uh, he did not say he ever went backwards. Well, uh, Rosenfeld said that. Yeah, though. well, different people said different things. There were a dozen witnesses, and they had different things to say. But we're looking at the evidence in the light most favorable to the defendant. May I please address briefly the broken promise issue, Your Honor? Thank you. So uh, the broken promise issue, I think, is a very serious issue. Uh, the, and there are lots of cases like this one, uh, uh, respectfully. Um, uh, trial counsel uh, may promise the jury in her opening that not only promises that the jury would hear this exculpatory evidence from Sierra, but made that promise the linchpin of her opening. And as this case, I think the language of the case, I think this court in Martin, which my brother uh, cited repeatedly, was that what she made was what, what the court there called an informed guess. And this court said that's not good enough. The court said no competent lawyer would have taken that risk under those circumstances. Counsel, did she file a motion in limine for, for a determination on the spontaneous utterance issue? No, she didn't, Your Honor. That's one of the things she could have done. Okay, well, so to, in, in this calculus then, this didn't have to be a guess, right? Correct, correct. So, but, but if you choose not to go ahead and file the motion in limine and, and, and proceed at risk, that why is that manifestly unreasonable when there was a way to divine what the trial judge would have done? Because it's, it's, manifest, when you, it's manifestly unreasonable to go forward like that when there are different things you can do to avoid or mitigate the risk. One, a motion limine. Two, defer your opening. Three, make an opening without making this promise the linchpin of your opening. All of these have been suggested by this court and by the First Circuit as alternatives. You don't just kind of throw it out there and hope for the best. That's counsel, what she did. Counsel, once that happened, once she did that, and once the witness didn't produce or wasn't produced and the witness wasn't called and she didn't get it in otherwise, was there any, uh, did, did she ever address that with the jury in the closing? Or was there an instruction by the judge on this issue? I think that's a great question, Your Honor. There's one ca there's a case, a federal case I cite, I think Williams out of uh, California, where the, the court sort of addressed that question. Okay, what do you do now? <laughs> you know, you made this promise. You can't keep the promise. And yeah, there are several things you can do. You can ask the judge to give an instruction that as a result of evidence, you know, you recall, basically just say to the jury, it's not her fault. Based on evidentiary rulings made during the trial, uh, 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 he didn't testify. Or you ask for leave to argue to, to tell that to the jury. Uh, you know, I promise you this because of a ruling of evidence that was made by the court. I wasn't able to present that testimony. You know, I'm sorry. Something with, without not just ignoring it. I mean, these cases say it's worse if you just don't say anything. She made it, not only did she not, she made it worse because she got up in her closing and said, you didn't hear from Mr. Sierra. Do you wonder what he was going to say? Now, the judge sustained the objection to that line of argument. But if, if the jury had possibly forgotten the promise, which I submit they hadn't, 
She reminded them <laughs> that she had made this promise. She didn't explain why she I, I don't know how it fits into the calculus here, probably not at all, but it would make uh, life a lot easier for trial judges um, and for fairer trials if both sides, when they've got bombs like this, that they uh, present it to the judge by way of a motion and eliminate before the opening. Of, of course, when, you, when there's something this critical, as, I mean, as a, as a trial lawyer, I mean, I like I like to I like to spring surprises, but this was no surprise. This was evidence everybody knew about, and she was making this a centerpiece of her defense. Of course, as Justice George suggested, she should have filed a motion to eliminate. You know, am I going to be able to get this in before she put her whole put it out there to the jury that this was what this was going to be the 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 linchpin of her whole claim of self defense, and it blew up in her face. And, and the defendant suffered as a result of that, that's manifestly unreasonable, taking that risk under those circumstances. Um, and the result, uh, the, the prejudice is obvious. And I think that uh, I, in, in some, Your Honors, uh, this is actually, this case is a great illustration of how 33E uh, can work to rectify injustice. This court, sua sponte, after oral argument, remanded for a determination, uh, an evidentiary hearing on on these ineffective assistance issues. There was a evidentiary hearing. There are detailed findings, 31 pages long, by, a trial, by the trial judge, the motion judge. And as a result, uh, a miscarriage of justice uh, was rectified by the motion judge. And I asked this court uh, to affirm his decision. It was not an abuse of discretion. It was not manifestly unreasonable. It was the correct and appropriate result. Thank OK. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.